thank you very much and good morning. I hope you had a good evening yesterday and you made it safely through the traffic today. Uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm Sebastian and I would quickly like to introduce myself um, and give you a little bit of my background. So I'm a principal data scientist at Bayer. Uh, I'm in the decision science team called Language AI and my background is computer science. And I'm happy to be here because when I was at TU Berlin as a master's student, I actually was participating in the Buzzwords 2011. I think it was the second Berlin Buzzwords. And I took so much from this. I think it was my first conference. Um, yeah, so nice little piece of history for me as well. Um, yeah, I'm coming from search engine context. Um, I did a lot of work on NLP language models before they became large. I'm mostly interested in access to knowledge and healthcare. And also nowadays, I mostly would say I work with people and machines. Um, so I'm interested in designing products that are interactive, that can have conversations with their users. Um, and I also like to make music. So I'm trying to combine all of this together. Um, yeah, and I'm, as I'm a representative of Bayer today, I need to give a short disclaimer that this presentation is based on my own opinion. But I also want to introduce Bayer just quickly uh, to you as a life science company, which is a global leader in healthcare and nutrition. And we are operating in three divisions, crop science, pharmaceuticals, and consumer health in 83 countries. And we have almost uh, over 99,000 employees worldwide, which is a big challenge if we're talking about scaling a platform. So, what happened in 2023? I think we all know generative AI really hit the field um, and uh, was promising a lot of um, transformative potential to all the companies. Um, and especially in the life science industry, um, McKinsey um, is talking about a potential of up to $440 billion um, for the industry. Um, and as the processes in pharma are centered around documents and texts and knowledge and large knowledge bases, um, this is an ideal opportunity for buyer as well. And as access to chat GPT almost become a commodity in, in 2023, we decided to make a strategic invest into generative AI. So what are the challenges for scaling a Gen AI platform on this enterprise level? Of course, first of all, we want secure and compliant access to the language models. Um, we want to have access to our internal knowledge, but also external knowledge, um, such as uh, research literature. We need to be able to handle very long documents with hundreds of pages containing text, tables, graphics, photos, plots, and also um, references from the literature. Of course, the results need to be reliable. And all of this scalable to almost 100,000 employees at low cost, ideally. So that's, that's kind of the dream. And we have built this platform with an internal team. Uh, I'm super proud of this team. And we have um, really uh, used a lot of open source software to be able to um, deliver this fast. So just at one glance, this software, this platform is called MyGenesis. It's a generative AI operating system that enables everyone at Bayer um, to access this value chain in a secure environment. Um, and I want to just give you at a glance what's in there, and then afterwards I will explain a little bit more in detail. Um, so we try to check all the important boxes at the very beginning with an internal team um, based in a secure environment. We're tailoring it to Bayer. And we are delivering this platform with a UI that you can see here. It's kind of a chatbot UI, so everyone can democratize, uh, in a democratized way, access it. But we're also offering it as, a, as an API because we have, of course, a lot of data science teams who want to use these models as well in a compliant way. So in this talk, I will tell you about three of the learnings that we have made um, when we move this platform from a crawling state into a running state within the first 12 months. Um, and I really have to say, scaling this platform is not only so much a technical challenge, and 
we all are experts in this, but it's also a big change process that needs to focus on the people who use this platform. And I want to start with the people. So the first learning is understand the intents of your users. So we started very early to crowdsource use cases in Bayer and ask everyone to um, yeah, to submit their ideas how we can use this from very small use cases up to the really big gold and valuable use cases. Um, and our challenge is to identify the central user story behind those use cases. And we picked 85 of those cases where we had kind of detailed descriptions and stakeholders to interview um, were inspired from the research on search intentions. And we identified the 20 most common activities on a very low level that people would expect from an LLM agent. And these people were not experts, right? They just have used maybe ChatGPT in their private time, um, so they knew a little bit how it worked. Um, and some of them were also professional healthcare scientists. So one of the groups that we, um, that we, that we saw was just very basic functionality of looking up information and also transforming and learning about this information, um, such as searching and summarization. Then there's a second group of activities which require stronger interaction, like a chat conversation, for example, and we call this assistance, because it is an interactive kind of process that happens. And then finally, um, there are these investigatory activities which require much more cognitive capacity, such as discovery and simulation. And of course, not all of them are uh, just, just working out of the box, so we had to pick a little bit on how, how we tailor these use cases and how we tailor the platform to enable the most important ones. And we, we defined six central archetypes, um, which are the most important ones um, to really help all of our stakeholders to speak the same language, because we are all we were all learning beginning of 23 um, how Gen AI works. Um, so the top three are more like the simple ones: text rewriting, content creation, and ideation. This is typical use cases you can do in a chatbot scenario. And the bottom ones are a little bit more complex because process automation requires some kind of interactivity between systems. Knowledge searching, it requires access to external knowledge or retrieval augmented generation. And then insights generation is really something where you expect value coming directly out of the model. Um, so this is also very challenging. So let's move to the second learning. And this is work backwards the value chain. And I just want to show this value chain because um, sometimes when we have the technical focus on, on how such a system looks like, um, we forget about this whole end-to-end -end process, which is fine. I think we, we really need to focus into in each individual part in this value chain, and probably there are even more. Um, but of course, what we want to achieve in the end is measurable value. right? We want a return of invest into this platform. Um, and that's why we started to really work backwards. And it is a combination between the technology at the beginning of this value chain and then the business processes at the end of this value chain. And most importantly, the, where these two chains meet is where the people are and where the interaction happens. And now with LLMs and with the conversational models, um, this interface has really transformed from being, let's say, a programming language where data scientists have to uh, program Python in order to access the knowledge and then create UIs in order to show it. Um, and now people can just prompt, right? They, we, we have this natural language interface, um, which makes it really easy for business people to access data science processes. But this translation is, is where we need to put our focus on. Um, yeah, so working backwards, I already talked about how we started to understand the user intents. Um, of course, um, we very early um, 
tried to uh, give access and gave access to ChatGPT in a secure, legal, and compliant way to everyone um, using open source software, which was in the beginning also not very mature. So we had a, to do a lot of work in order to make it stable and also contributed back into the, the open source world. Um, and then we noticed there's this one gap um, between the technology and the business, which is the prompting. And um, we all might think about prompting as a natural language, but I think it is not natural. It is a hidden code. You need to learn how this works. So that's why we started really a, a, big, um, a big amount of learning opportunities and helping everyone to upskill themselves to learn how to prompt engineer. And one of the missing pieces in the end, um, um, what we got from the user feedback, so we, we were constantly listening to our first users, was um, we need to be able to put our own knowledge into these models. We cannot rely on what's in ChatGPT. So we built a document um, upload feature with QA, and that was our first iteration, which we could refer to as making it crawl, um, yeah, almost one year ago. We also thought about um, how we can evaluate the results of these models. Um, in a very early stage, everyone thinks about, OK, let's do thumbs up, thumbs down ratings. But we also learned this gives us not enough signal on really um, identifying the, the causes of the errors. So we made a little bit more um, refined scale ABCD. And we also introduced seven dimensions of um, response quality, um, which we were asking our users to give feedback on, um, uh, so such as the validity of the answer, completeness, accuracy, conformity to the um, expectations, integrity, timeliness, and of course, consistency in the overall process. And then the third learning, it's I think the most important one, what made us um, or what enabled us to really bring this to the enterprise scale is to deliver with speed, to be re really first mover very early, um, but keep iterating. So we are, of course, not done and it's, of course, not perfect, um, but we want um, basically to everyone to participate in our learnings as a team how these platforms work. Um, so what we did after this first iteration, which has shown um, high potential in, in the first use cases, and we, we addressed the learnings from our early adopters after a 90-day cycle, um, and we really started to, um, yeah, to develop the vision that MyGenesis will become the buyer central Gen AI operating system. So until then, it was kind of an experimental platform, but um, we got so much great feedback and everyone loved the product. Um, that's why we really kept um, inventing it and uh, improving it. Um, so we introduced more um, elaborate quality metrics nowadays based on Langfuse and Ragas. I think we had a great talk yesterday by Sixth um, about uh, the opportunities and the, the possibilities of evaluating. I, I learned a lot already. Um, we identified also the golden use cases, the ones that we want to put efforts in and, and help everyone um, to, to move faster. Um, we started to create a community within the 100,000 employees of Bayer to talk about Gen AI, to give us feedback and to learn together. Um, and on top of the security, legal and compliance framework, we also put more governance and guardrails um, in order to be able to roll out to a broader audience. And then we identified one more piece. Um, and who, who of you knows what an LLM agent is? Okay, I see. I already see a couple of hands, and who of you has implemented or used such an agent? Okay, o only two people. All right. So for us, that was really the key, and I will go into detail in a second how this agent works, um, because for us, that was the key um, to be able to use the LLM 
to make more complex decisions um, and also to plan ahead and, 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 and uh, access more data sources. So we started to do REC on several data sources. We introduced a reusable REC toolkit so that um, other, other uh, teams in Bayer can build their own RECs. And I will show you how we connect them. And we also noticed in the value chain there's an important piece missing. And we fully ignored this um, um, in the beginning, knowing that it exists and it's, of course, data quality. So whenever you put data into, this, uh, into these value chains, you need to make sure um, the quality is right. And we also noticed um, the biggest improvements in the measurable value in the end um, is really by improving the document parsing in the beginning. Because so many things go wrong um, when you parse tables and you forget about them, or even if the tokenizers are messing up with the, um, with the healthcare kind of language. So that was our second iteration four months later, um, which really brought us uh, to, to a bigger scale. Um, I have a couple of minutes left. I just want to briefly show you the very simplified architecture of this agent, um, because it's an important learning for us. So this works um, whenever our users are requesting something from the LLM, um, we are putting the agent in front of it, so the agent will decide what to do, basically. Um, and so the agent uh, can decide, OK, I need to search the web for getting information about challenges of, the, uh, of responsible use of AI. So it can search the web, it uses a tool, downloads and parses the references, and then summarizes them and delivers back a very nice result um, based on all these tools. And our internal data is implemented as tools. So all the little REC frameworks, REC toolkits, they sit on top of the data platforms um, and help us to, to access this knowledge. Yeah, and there we are today. So uh, today the platform is accessible for over 40,000 employees. Um, we support a lot of uh, use cases, accessing knowledge, creation of content. Um, of course, we keep iterating. The biggest challenges nowadays are integrating with data in the enterprise uh, platforms, um, multimodal input and output, such as voice, audio, video. PowerPoint presentations is a big thing, you know. Um, we are working on making the use of AI as responsible as possible. And yeah, I think really the last highlight is we all package this now into customizable assistance so that our users can share their, I would say, their chains and their prompts within other um, users um, in Bayer and within the teams of Bayer so that it's easy to, to share the learnings. So thank you very much. That was a quick overview on my Genesis. Um, and I'm open for questions. Thanks very much, Sebastian Arnold. Do we have questions in the audience? Yes. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, it's really impressive work you guys have done. Um, you started very early, so at the beginning of 2023, I guess. And you talked about compliance uh, with stuff like you know, like GPR, the works, you know, you know what we're talking about. And at that time, um, you, you mentioned ChatGPT uh, directly, so I uh, assume you guys were using the OpenAI uh, APIs. I wonder, have things changed in terms of compliance since then? Have you moved to like, uh, stuff that is behind Asia or maybe to different LLMs? Can you tell us a bit about your journey there for compliance? Yeah, yeah, that's a, a great question because that's the biggest blocker for, for everyone to move into Gen AI. And I cannot tell about any kind of relationships we have, we have with other companies. Um, but what we do is, of course, we have a very strong internal compliance um, organization and, and very strong processes that we are following. And they help us to also um, define different levels of compliance. Um, and let's say on the very strongest compliance levels, we also offering open source LLMs that we host internally um, to make sure really we are in a secured environment. And if we're just talking about, let's say, simple summarization of 
data that is not confidential and not internal, we can also be a little bit broader. Um, and of course, the next challenge is also to make this compliance with drug development, with patient safety and so on. And so at the moment, um, we are not allowed to roll this out, of course, to customer facing products. We have time for one more quick question. Yes. A very quick one. <laughs> uh, thanks, Sebastian. Great talk. Um, you, you're using RAGAS to do evaluation at the, the upper level. Can you talk a bit about the evaluation and measurement you're doing at the R level of RAG, the retrieval step? Yeah, um, that's a great question because we have also ignored this in the beginning a little bit because we wanted to move with speed and have people addressing and touching the responses very early. Um, and now we established um, some offline processes for evaluating, um, I would say, uh, some of the example use cases we have gathered and we're constantly running them in order to monitor the LLMs and monitor the end-to-end -end process or at least the REC process. Um, I've, seen, I've seen some platforms incorporating this already on the user level so that the users can upload their own data sets and monitor their own, um, their own processes and use cases. And as we have now introduced those assistants which encapsulate those use cases. Probably one of the future steps will also be to make this available to the users so they can bring their own data and have their own um, yeah, quality measures. All right, our time is up. Thanks again, Sebastian. Thank you very much.